welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we are going to be rejoining Gemma Files for part two of our interview. If you missed part one, all you need to do is head back one episode to 163, where we talk to Gemma about experimental film, autism, story lessons, and much, much more. Before we get into the conversation, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. First up, Castle Rock Radio and Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. And second up is Audible. Head on over to www.audibletrial.com forward slash this is horror for a free 30 day trial. Choose from over 180,000 titles for your Kindle, for your Android, for any device really. And there's so many to choose from. At the moment, I'm listening to The Illustrated Man by Ray Bradbury, so I highly recommend it. So that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash this is horror. And with that said, without taking up any more of your time, let's do it. Let's get to part two of our interview with Gemma Files. And now for a horror interview. You said, Bob, that that video, that movie we were talking about, the Italian one, with the typewriter, is available on YouTube? Yep. Yes, it's on YouTube. It's Mm. called Zader. Mm. Z-E-D-E-R. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out soon. It sounds like a, kind of like a, man, like a horror version of Zeroville, you know? Uh... You know, Steve Erickson novel where the guy finds a uh, right. Every every film has got this one segment in every film ever made. And uh, I don't know. That's I don't know, man. If Steve Erickson ever wrote anything that's weird, that would be to me. That's probably right there in the weird. Cool. I'll check it out. Zero. Oh, you've never read it? Nope. Oh well. <clears throat> it's it's really good. This guy he uh, he starts off as a uh, he gets mixed up with the Manson murders. Oh yeah, and yeah, uh, he happens to uh, to attend a uh, like a party, and I want to say it's been a while since I read a book. I think it's uh, I think he attended the party. It was at Sharon Tate's house. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, it's. And there's, you know, and then police and everything. He actually gets questioned and everything, but he, he warms his way into the film industry as an editor. Right. And that's where he discovers, you know, the, uh, the, the scene and he, he starts dissecting the scene and he starts uh, digging into, to, you know, lost films and, you know, and, and actually splicing together, you know, you know, one one image from these films and, and splices them all together and gets and gets this one track. And it's just oh it's it's a pretty pretty wild book. That's it's funny how that that particular idea just re- occurs and recurs uh in literature generally. Um I didn't read uh Flickr, for example, until after I'd written experimental film. Um, and the year that I was up for the Shirley Jackson, um, Ellen Datlow turned up with a, with a, with a copy of, um, Flickr and basically threw it at me. It's like, it's like, it's only 50 bucks. You have to, you have to buy it. You have to read this, (laughs) you have to read this book. And indeed, if you've never read Flickr, you absolutely should read Flickr because it is crazy. It's completely nuts. 
Um, but yeah, this idea that uh, there is a secret language of film, that film contains things that you cannot see, that they're just, you know, sort of hovering on the edge of your vision, um, and that film is very directly being used to manipulate you uh, in the same way that um, commercials uh, are used to manipulate you, uh, using right. much the same language. Um, this is just something that, that shows up everywhere. Um, it, it might just be this sort of human idea that um, any kind of language can be used to lie, any kind of language can be used to deceive, um, but I think it goes back further. It, you know, the, the idea of iconoclasm, <clears throat> the idea um, that an image uh, is by nature uh, something that's kind of unholy. Um, the idea behind iconoclasm, uh, the idea that um, mm, you shouldn't make a picture of God, you shouldn't make a picture of the Virgin Mary, you shouldn't make a picture of a saint, um, really uh, came out of the idea that if a human mind can conceive something and uh, an image is filtered through a human being, then it is not perfect, uh, no matter if the thing that it's depicting is supposed to be perfect. Uh, and therefore, even if it's an image of something holy, there is an element of the unholy to it. And it is a lie, and it has to be destroyed. Um, so, I, th I think if you go back far enough, that's, uh, that's what you see with that, with that idea. Um, the idea that not just film, but really any human creative endeavor is, and any fiction is, uh, is a lie that is meant to deceive. Any fiction is, is to some degree of, of the devil. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that makes sense. That makes sense. I've always been fascinated with the, you know, like we're talking about the, the I guess the subliminal aspect of it. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I have, you know, a background in psychology. So and it always irks me when someone talks about, you know, auditory subliminal messages, which you can't have. Uh, your ears hear differently than the way that your eye sees. So you can only right. have a subliminal message if it's visual and you know you get into you know lengthy arguments with people about this kind of stuff what about back masking well it doesn't really work <laughs> it's a bunch of bullshit it's what it is but that concept's always fascinated me uh even before i learned about you know the actual sensation and perception of, of you know, vision and hearing and uh, like you mentioned, ancient images, you know, it kind of it, it kind of taps into that, but it goes it goes further, it goes further. I mean, I haven't read that one in a long time, but uh, you know, and it, it got it got it got kind of slammed when it came out. But I always liked that book by Ramsey Campbell. That was just it's gorgeous. It um, is. It's one of the books, best books he's ever read, uh, written. I would agree. Um, and one of the best books that I've ever read. But yeah, I, I, it it's it is one of my favorite works. Uh. Between that and, uh, and the Parasite. Yeah, Parasite is great. Um, I really love uh, The Nameless as well. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, I went through all those. Uh, because I think the first one that I ever tried to read when I was younger was Obsession. And mm. uh, it, it, it's the, that paperback with the envelope and the blood on the envelope. Right, and, you know, and it just it kept intriguing me, and I couldn't. I, at first, I couldn't get into it, and then uh, at the library they had a paperback of the Parasite, and uh, but the same guy, and I said, okay, well, I'll try that out, and uh, I was probably way, way too young, probably I would say probably fifteen or sixteen years old, to to get a full, comprehensive understanding of what was going on. And, but after, after that, I was able to actually read Obsession. And then I went to Incarnate, The Nameless, Midnight Sun, uh, The Influence. I went through Midnight all of those. Sun. Oh my God. I love Midnight Sun. Oh, it's great. Yes. It's great. Yeah. But, it, and it seemed like that there was like this, this theme that he kept coming back to. And then I read, uh, Cold Print, which is his, uh his collection of his early 
uh, Lovecraftian tales. Yes, that's right. And then, uh, and then Ancient Images came out, and I read that, and I, I, I think at that time that was when I when I went away from supernatural horror and went into mm. uh, my dad had read uh, Red Dragon. Which I right. grabbed at the library and because it, it looked interesting and, and he wanted something to read, so I gave it to him, you know. And I remember I was playing uh, guitar in my room. I was playing around with my acoustic guitar and he came and threw the book on my bed and just said, he goes, stop what you're doing and read that book. <laughs> That's great. And I'm like, did you like it? Because he was very, very, he loved to read, but he was a very picky reader. And he goes, right. That's one of the best books I've ever read. And I'm like, okay. So, and I put my guitar up and I read Red Dragon. And from that point on, I was like, oh man, serial killers. Everything in the world that I'm going to read is now going to be serial killers. So I got on that kick. And it, yeah. And, and, of course and, it and it's just... funny because when you, when you look at Harris, Red, again, in hindsight, um, his, his serial killer fiction, it really has like this big whiff of the supernatural to it, you know. Um, I was reading Elliot Layton's Hunting Humans around the same time that I was reading uh, Silence of the Lambs and, and Red Dragon. Um, and uh, Layton, w- when he was interviewed, would, you know, kind of slag on Thomas Harris a little because he'd be like, you know, nobody's actually like that. Nobody can actually be like that. <laughs> it's, um, it's, 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 it's kind of ridiculous. Um, but yeah, Harris is coming at it from this from this point of view of I'm um, I'm creating a person who, to some degree, is as unlikely as Count Dracula. But I'm dropping him into the middle of the BAU. I'm dropping him into the middle of the the idea of serial killers, um, and everything around it has a lot more resonance and a lot more reality. Um, and then, of course, it wasn't until I was older that I really began to appreciate the character of Will Graham the way that I think I, I would have had I been older when I when I first read those books. Right. I mean, he's... he's he, The character, he's, he's very tragic. Uh, yes. But it, in, in a sense that he was also very relatable, especially to me, because I do have... I have a... a I don't have what they call photographic memory. I do have an auditorial memory where i can remember Mm. entire conversations with people which in other words if you try to lie to me (laughs) yeah then then you you probably won't be able to do it successfully and i will catch you in it and whether i choose to bust you right then and there or give you more rope to hang yourself with is uh, strictly up to you (laughs) you know uh and sometimes i can catch it right then and there so i related to that that kind of you know the kind of mentality that, you know, people become obsessed with things. And I became obsessed with, with, with being it, with not trying to remember things because it would, it came naturally to me, but it just, right. it, it just, by the concept of it, I was obsessed with that. I was like, man. And once I realized it, that I could do that, I was like, wow, that's, that's something other people can't do. And I think that's, you know, if, if that's a superpower, then that's probably one of mine. <laughs> but yeah, he was, a exactly. really, he was a really tragic character. I didn't relate to him as much as I related to, uh, to, to some of the peripheral characters in Red Dragon the first time I read it. It, was, it wasn't until probably maybe the second or third time that I read it, probably the third time I read it, that I really felt a connection to Will. Even though he was a fascinating character and he was very compelling, uh... You know, I, I didn't, of course, you know, saying that, it's like, well, did you identify with Francis? Did you identify with Dr. Lecter? No, <laughs> no, no, no. It was more of the, you know, I kind of identified with Freddie, uh, identified with, uh, you know, with, with Crawford. Uh, yep. Of course, around that time, uh, you know, uh, Red Manhunter, uh, because, you know, uh, discovered that Crawford's character was based off of, you know, uh, what's his John name? John Douglas. Yeah, John Douglas. John Douglas. And I'm, I'm very I'm very grateful that I was able to, to, to go down that path because it, it led me to a lot of really, really good fiction. 
you know, absolutely. And, and it's like, you know, and, and now I'm like, I'm so excited that Amazon's got, you know, like Harry Bosch, you know, and I'm like, yeah. cause, I, cause I like Michael Conley, man, that was my bread and butter, you know, and the poet, even though that's not even like a real Bosch story, it's just, oh man, so good. <laughs> so Titus good. Welliver is so good in that. And, oh, yeah. um, in, in the third uh, season, they do a version of the darkness, uh, more than night. Um, of course they can't have Terry, what's his name come in because, um, probably there's like some kind of conflict, uh, in terms of those two stories, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really great. It's a wonderful series. Uh, every time I hear that Bosch is updated, I just go on a binge oh, yeah. and, you know, watch the entire thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm breaking it down it. one episode a week. Cause I, cause I know it's going to come to an end. I'm going to run out of episodes and I'm going to be mad. <laughs> so I only watch one a week and it's hard to do that. Cause it's kind of like, ah, man, I really want to yeah. see what happens, but you know, okay. Cliff hang me. That's fine. <laughs> well, again, you know, that's, that's one of the ways that the world has changed. Um, I remember describing to somebody once, uh, waiting, uh, for the next issue of Watchmen. Um, and, how difficult it was to have just read issue five, which is the Rorschach issue, and spend like an entire month feeling like, oh my God, the world sucks. Little girls are butchered and fed to dogs, and you know, <laughs> uh, you know, sparks fly up into darkness, and uh, everything is awful, awful, awful. And then you know, the next issue came out, and it was. You know, Night Owl and Silk Spectre two getting it on, <laughs> and you you left Still that no going. Oh, yeah, actually, things are things are fine. things are okay. <laughs> you know? uh, but just the idea that you had to wait an entire month for it <laughs> and get a physical issue and open it up and see what happened. Um, man, there are people today who don't understand that in the slightest. I that guess the concept. Closest, yeah, I guess the closest thing we have to that now is is like since we we binge you know watch these series on TV and TV is so important now that mm -hmm. we the the closest thing to that would be waiting for the next season. It's like you're just yes. waiting on pencil yeah meals. exactly instead of waiting a month yeah. you're waiting a year or like <laughs> in Westworld you're waiting two years. Year and a half. That's true. And it's like, That's true. God damn, can, can you can you do it? I don't understand why, but, and this is like a kind of interesting segue, because I wanted to yeah. ask you about this. Please. Do you feel that as as we have gone into a more of a television type of, of, of medium, meaning that we're mm -hmm. definitely in the golden age of television, if there ever is such a thing, that... The written word, especially concerning horror fiction, is possibly now more influenced by film and television than fiction that is that has happened. You know, that's been written years ago. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to take that in two parts. The first one, uh, the first part I'm going to say is that because um, I because I come from a film criticism background and because I have watched an insane amount of films in, in my lifetime, like a crazy, crazy amount of films in my lifetime. Um, that was always part of, of what I was dealing with in terms of storytelling, uh, in terms of the mechanics of storytelling. And, um, I remember when I first started writing, um, I thought that the that the thing that was most um, influential on me was, in fact, Vertigo Comics, because um, it, Vertigo Comics showed me with with things like Sandman um, uh, and um, you know and, and comics like that that you could shove an amazing amount of information into a single panel um, because you had. Everything was available to you. Um, you could 
show what people were thinking. You could imply what people were feeling. You could show what people were doing. You could um, have diegetic music playing in the background. You could have, um, you could have, uh, yeah, in the background behind the thought balloons uh, that was kind of commenting on what was happening at the same time. Um, you could have people's memories intruding. And you could see people's memories intruding. And, you know, that, that was very fascinating to me. Uh, it was as though everything was available to me. Um, and when I started to write screenplays and teach people screenwriting, I would have to take many people who otherwise, you know, much, much like myself, um, writing that first uh, article uh, for journalism school, um, I'd have to take them apart, uh, aside and say, uh, you know, everything that you're used to being able to control, just let go of that. The only thing that you have control over in a script is what you can see and what you can hear. And that's it. That's the whole thing. Everything else is open to interpretation and will be open to interpretation. You will not, you will not probably be filming this. You will not probably be directing this. Um, so just... I think of it as a blueprint that somebody else is going to use to build a building that you may not even like when they're done with it. But yeah, I've always been, um, I've always been interested in when I write, um, preserving things like a jump cut <laughs> or a dissolve, you know, or the, uh, the sensation that you have where, you're like, well, do I actually have to show you how we got from here to there? No, not really. I can just go from here to there. You know, that uh, come, in, come in late and leave early um, uh, thing that is very much part of screenwriting um, where you have to find the most important moment in a scene and do that and then move on, move on, move on. Um, that sense of pace. Um, sometimes, uh, depending on the mood that you're trying to build, the pace becomes slower or the pace becomes faster. Sometimes, um, sometimes the details become clearer or they become less clear, um, depending on the story that you're trying to tell. Um, but you are always, you're, I'm, I'm always seeing it play out not only as a series of sentences, but also, uh, to some degree, is a series of uh, a series of images. But weirdly enough, they're like emotion inflected images. You know, what is what is the emotional moment that I'm that I'm working towards here? Um, which has a lot to do with I don't know, just the way that I put stories together. Often, uh, when I start to work, I have the beginning and I have the end, and then. Um, I have to figure out how, not just how you get from there to there, but why you get from there to there. Why you have to get from there to there. I know what has to happen, but I don't know why it has to happen. And it's finding out the why that gives you the emotional moments that drive the thing forward. Um, so, so there's that. Um, I think as we get into a more... There, there are two things that I've seen um, that are happening because of the centrality of the TV narrative. And the first one is that people are getting um, bored with and uh, annoyed with filmic conventions of storytelling, which is kind of interesting. Um, because on some level, they understand that you cannot go as deep with a movie in some ways as you can with a TV show. Um, I remember going to see, for example, Hidden Figures, which is a wonderful film, but to some degree it plays like a hagiography of the, of the, of the main characters, and I totally understand why you would want, um, why you'd want a story about these little-known ladies who should be more well-known um, these, these black mathematicians, uh, black female mathematicians driving parts of the NASA, um, moonshot pro program that you never heard about, um, why you would want, you know, why you would want to sh tell a story that's uplifting and a story that's, um, that's beautiful and affectionate. Um, and you don't want to go too 
you don't want to go too far uh, into that story because you want to hit it hard and you want to hit it fast and you want to make people happy and you want to get out the back of it. Um, but as I was watching it, I thought it would be really nice if, you know, you could go a little deeper, if you could do like a Mad Men version of this, if you had eight hours with these people as opposed to two hours with these people, if you had, you know, if you had 10 hours with these people as opposed to two hours with these people, because if that happened, then possibly not only would these ladies not be plaster saints, but also maybe some of these white authority figures would not be plaster devils either. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, unfortunately, there's this, there's this moment where you sort of go, oh, okay, so this particular guy just exists to be a foil. He's just there to be sort of the, the character that Jim Parsons plays. He's just there to be like pulling a face in the background um, as she's doing the math that he can't do. And, you know, going, I just don't understand. And once you've seen that once, I, I don't know if you have to see it like over and over and over. Um, and by the end, she hasn't really changed from the person that she was in the first in the first scene. And he hasn't changed from the person that he was in the first scene either. And when you're used to seeing Breaking Bad, you know, or Orange is the New Black or whatever, you expect some movement. You expect to see people change. But you don't have time to see people change. Right. And, you know, it, it becomes particularly difficult when you're dealing with absolute one-shot narratives. Um People complain about, about um, come on, uh, about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and, and the DC Cinematic Universe. People complain about comic book movies. My mother, for example, is a, a huge non-fan of comic book movies. Uh, she thinks all of them should be cut by about half, half an hour to uh, get rid of useless action that you tend to fall asleep during. Um, but one of the things that they have, and, and, you know, and stuff like Star Wars and Star Trek also has this, because they come from a larger universe, a larger enfolded universe, you know, um, they're, they're drawing from a much larger mythology, and they occupy a space where they are like a chapter in an ongoing story. Each one of them is a chapter in an ongoing story. Here's what Spider-Man was doing while that was happening over here. Here's what Thor was doing while that was happening over here. Blah, 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 blah. And things do change from um, moment to moment. Things do change from one shot to one shot because there's a, there's a sense of a larger unfolding universe that's changing in the background. Um, so, you know, for all that people complain about, you know, superhero movie making, at least you have this sense of movement you have the sense that the characters are changing and that the world around them is changing and that makes it more like television in that particular way but certainly that's why watching daredevil is better than watching spider-man homecoming to some degree you know because you're going to get a lot more out of it you're going to get a lot more time with daredevil <laughs> that way you're going to um you're going to see a lot of things explored that you're not going to be able to explore in a two-hour shot. Um, so the weird thing is that that actually means that chaptered narrative, particularly novels, particularly series of novels, is more like television than it is like film. Um, you'll note that the best adaptations um, from prose to film are not books to film in the main I mean there's exceptions to that rule uh LA Confidential for example is an amazing adaptation of a book but it's an amazing adaptation of a book in which it's very very not like the book at all you know it's exactly like a James Elroy story but if you go point by point through the book LA Confidential the movie LA Confidential isn't even vaguely like that you know it's like they took they took almost nothing from the actual novel, except these three characters doing this thing in Los Angeles during this time period. Mm. Yeah, um, I love both of them. Uh, I love, I love the, I love the movie a little bit more. 
I think it moves better. Um, but what they did was they managed to completely catch the sense of Elroyness. You know, you're like, oh my god, that's a James Elroy narrative. Wow, yeah, people looking and walking and talking like James Elroy is, you know, has a key in their back and is moving them around. You know, it's like that's that that's what makes that a really good adaptation. Because if you look at it point by point, it's a terrible adaptation. <laughs> Um, but if you look at really uh, good point-by-point -point adaptations, most of the time, they're from short stories. A short story makes a really good movie. A book does not usually make a really good movie. Um, and that is because a book is far more like a TV series. A book is like a, is like a, is like, um, a season of a TV series. So in a strange way, um, this popularity of TV narrative structure bodes really well for, um, for novels at least, novels and series of novels. Where it has a weirder impact is in the popularity of short fiction, but on the other hand, short fiction has never been quote, quote, mainstream popular. That's a strange thing. Um, it, particularly in, in horror, I think that short fiction can do stuff that a long-range narrative, like a chaptered narrative, it's really difficult to maintain a mood of intense horror or a mood of intense questioning or more, a mood of intense weirdness for an entire book. It's really hard. You know, you have to, you have to choreograph it. You, you'll, you'll go in and, and you'll go out and you have to just find a way to, to move along with it. But with, a, but with a, a piece of short fiction, it's kind of wonderful because you can just get in and punch somebody in the face and leave. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you can throw them down a hole and leave them there. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about getting them back up out of the hole because there's no time. <laughs> um, when, I, when I was teaching, I mean, you know, most, most of the time when I am teaching, uh, I'm teaching people to write short stories. And one of the things that I end up saying is, you know, people are always like, oh, I'm at the mercy of my muse. I can't think of the next thing to do. And I'm like, listen, um, just cut it down as far as you can go because short story can take it. Um, the wonderful thing about short story is that you don't actually have to worry too much about characterization sometimes because if your plot is complex enough, then your character is going to reduce itself to automatically to so there's this guy or there's this girl you know and and they have like maybe one or two characteristics but just enough characteristics to get them to do the thing you need them to do and then the plot takes over and the mechanics move them forward um the more complicated the plot becomes the simpler the the person becomes um and it happens the other way as well you know it's like the the more complicated the character becomes this more simple the plot tends to become because you just don't have time. You can't do both. You can't do both at the same time. Um, I can't, I'm not saying nobody can do it, but I, I got to say I find it really difficult personally. Um, it becomes about the delivery system. It becomes about, you know, um, what's the best way to tell this story? Uh, do you tell it as an epistolary story? Do you tell it in a, uh, in a bunch of um, missives? Uh, do you tell it from the point of view of a person who is misinterpreting everything that they're seeing and somehow you're able to get across to the to the reader that this is what's going on? That's wonderful. I love that. Um, you know, what what POV do you see this through? You know, uh, it's, it's almost like um, hmm, it's almost like an event, uh, an advent calendar, you know, one of those little advent calendars and you're trying to figure out exactly which of those which of those doorways you should open and in what order you should open them uh, to tell the story right. that you need to tell. Um, I read this amazing story by Seanan McGuire, which was literally told in tweets. It was told in tweets, real-time tweets, by people investigating a haunted house. I don't remember the entire title, but part of it was hashtag don't go here. <laughs> I think that that was something uh, someone else 
Was that recently mentioned on Facebook? Um, it might have been. Some, some might have been. Someone mentioned a different story that was told over Twitter on a podcast that we recorded recently. I think it was yeah, it was but... either Victor Lavelle or Benjamin Percy. Yeah, I think it was mm-hmm. Victor. But it, it but was think... it wasn't this story. But this yeah. story sounds um, fascinating. Yeah, that story yeah. is in uh, what the Grolix is that, um, which is a uh, an anthology that I contributed something to. Um, I think sometime last last year or the year before, um, and. As usually happens, I only got around to reading all the rest of the stories later, and I got to that story and I was just like, oh my god, this is the best. <laughs> I wish I'd come up with that. Um, you know, she, she just, she's, she, she had it down. She had mastered that particular form, that delivery system. And by the end, you're like, you, you want to applaud. You want to find her somewhere and just go. <laughs> That's for you, Sean. And um, I'm have to check that out. Yeah, and this is the kind of stuff that you can do in short fiction. And you know, uh, like I said, short fiction has never been mainstream popular. You know, um, the hardest thing to sell is a collection of short fiction. Um, people want novels. They want series of of novels. You know, because. That's what people are attracted to. They want a big, thick book, you know, like a 600 pager, right? You know, something, uh, something big as a brick, something you can, you know, you can club a seal with. Um, but, you know, for my mind, um, particularly in terms of horror, short fiction is just aces. You can do stuff in short fiction that is so difficult to do in a longer sustained narrative and you know that's that's how you have to think about it that you know if if film is like short fiction then you know to some degree uh short fiction should be like film yeah i would agree i think that the the probably the best now horror is is actually in in that you know that I think the sweet spot's probably between twenty and thirty thousand words. Yeah, I think you probably- the novella yeah. and it. The internet brought that back, so we can thank the internet for that. Woo! Uh, because be, yeah, before before nobody wanted to do a novella. You had to you had to put it with another collection, yep. you know, or a full collection. Uh, it wasn't until the internet was out that we actually saw. And of course, when the movie came out, we actually saw The Mist as a standalone book. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And it's like before that, you had to get you know uh, the Kirby Macaulay anthology and then uh, Skeleton Crew to to, to actually read yep. it. You know. Yeah. And I and I found it in both places. I remember reading um, Dark Forces and just being blown away um, by. Oh, yeah, just about everything in that anthology, but you know, the mist, holy crap. Just like oh yeah. uh, man. Um yeah. Yeah, and I think it's like the first story too, so it's kinda like, man, if this is the first story, yeah, it's like, poof, the rest of it must the be. rest of them are <laughs> gonna be even better. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um and it is, you know, it's 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 full of incredible stories. Um yeah. Uh Ed Bryant's story and that haunted me for years and years and years. Um, and actually was a, a big sort of influence on the type of witchcraft that I ended up um, giving to uh, the characters that popped up in the stories, which were eventually uh, collected in We Will All Go Down Together. Um, that very, <laughs> that very um, palpable witchcraft, that, you know, very piss in a pan kind of witchcraft. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I think the shorter way is always the better way with horror. Um, and it's really difficult to maintain uh, the kind of mood that you want to maintain for, um, you know, to, to the length that you would normally expect with uh, a fantasy novel, you know, even a science fiction novel, um, you know, it's like there's there's. YA novels where I'm just like you know this is really good but at the same time I'm not sure you need to uh, 
to go on quite as long as you're going on. Oh, no, wait a minute. You're doing that because you want to stay in this place. The reader wants to stay inside of the story for as long as humanly possible because they're escaping something because, you know, they're, they're an adolescent, you know, they're a teenager, they're a young adult, you know, whatever's going on in their life is probably trapped to one degree or another, <laughs> she said, <laughs> assuming that everyone's, uh, that everyone's adolescence was as bad as, as hers, um, which I think is, you know, usually true. Uh, everyone thinks it is at any rate. Um, but yeah, that's why YA novels are as big as they are. Um, because people just want to crawl inside of them um, and stay there as long as humanly possible. But um, but when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, get off my lawn, um, you know, the stuff that I liked was stuff like the C.S. Lewis books um, or even stuff like Alan Garner's YA stuff um elador uh which is frankly terrifying oh my god i don't know why anybody would give their kid a copy of the moon of gomrath if they don't want the the child to like you know die of heart failure in their sleep but um you know all of those are tiny little books they're they're novellas they're tiny tiny little books chaptered but really slim um that's that's what I remember from when I was an adolescent. Uh, oh, and Kenneth Lee, too. Kenneth Lee was amazing. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I used to go into used bookstores and buy up Kenneth Lee by the bushel. You know, I'd buy her up by the arm load. You know, you'd see that, uh, that yellow daw spine, and you'd be like, there's some Kenneth Lee in there. Oh, my God. I got to oh, find yeah. it. And it was so great because um, these were tiny little books. Uh, I don't think I ever saw any book of hers that got, you know, larger than 200 pages. Um, But they were jam-packed with sex and decadence and blood. And, you know, everything was like an awful opera, you know, done on a, like a, like a Clark Ashton necromancer planet. (laughs) (laughs) Covered in gold and jewels. (laughs) And bleeding from every orifice, it was it was wonderful. Um, yeah, she was really great. I mean, I remember going to the library and, and picking up. Uh, they had a uh, a copy of uh, the Gorgon and other tales. Oh my God! And uh, and it was it, it was a hardback. And if there's ever a book that I want to steal from the library, that was the book. I did not steal it, uh, but I did go to the library sales after that to see if they actually had it for sale and they never did uh red is blood man that book uh red is blood you know like blew me away oh yeah versions of the grim fairy tales Mm -hmm. (laughs) oh dude (laughs) and see i missed the whole young when growing up i missed the whole young adult boom uh because you know before i started reading like you know adult fiction like stephen king peter straw ramsey campbell you know, my, my, my experience with horror fiction came from, uh, you know, uh, you know, the Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, uh, those kind of those kind of books. Uh, and then uh, Sherlock Holmes, you know, uh, I went into to that kind of thing. And so and I think young adult was actually just just starting to, to, to kind of get its gears flowing. Mm-hmm. And I, I missed it. I just, I just basically I skipped over it. You know, and I said, oh, okay, my dad's going to let me read this book called The Stand. <laughs> it's a big old thick book. It's going to take me forever to read this book. You know, three days later, I'm like, I need more Stephen King. Give it to me. Look <laughs> you know? oh, it to my veins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I started out with the first Stephen King book that I can remember that I really, uh, that I really connected with was Salem's Lot. Um. And, but, you know, I mean, my mom had a copy of Carrie and much like her copy of <laughs> Interview with the Vampire, I had stolen it from her night, from her nightstand and rifled through it, you know, to try and get to the really horrible and or adult bits. Um, but yeah, it was Salem's Lot. That was the, that was the thing that really connected with me immediately. And, you know, I was just fascinated with the, 
uh, you know, for one thing, the realism of it. You, you could tell that this was a place that he had been or he knew intimately. Uh, a town like this, a place like this, Maine, you know, he knew all these people. He'd seen them to one degree or another. He'd found them and kind of, you know, stuck them in there and rifled them, uh, you know, rifled them around a bit. And, and, you know, sometimes you look back on it and you can see where, where the serial filing, the serial numbers were filed off, you know, it's like, and, and you're sort of like, uh, you know, your main character is kind of you, right? And uh, the people that uh, don't like him is, are, are people that you've encountered in your life, right? And, uh, you know, this, this, this girlfriend, the perfect girlfriend that you happen to find as you're sitting in the, uh, you know, sitting in the, um, in the park and she comes up with a, with a copy of your book and wants you to, <laughs> and wants you to autograph it, you know, all this and all that. But, but further and above that, there was an amazing, um, ambition about the whole thing. Like I'm going to put this uh, this town together, and it's going to be like a it's going to be like a machine with a million moving parts, and I will control every one of those parts, and I will make you feel things, and I will make you fear, and I will open up the parts of the advent calendar, and behind this one, you've got uh, uh, you know someone sacrificing a little child to Satan, and behind this one, you've got two guys you know, bearing, uh, bearing a casket and one guy falling into the grave and just, just falling in love with the coffin and waiting in there until something, something comes out of the coffin and, you know, chomps on him. And when you open this one, you've got a little boy standing outside the window trying to get you to let him in. And when you open this one, you've got a cross made out of tongue depressors that actually works when you brandish it against a, a vampire. It was, it was incredible. It was, you know, it was like a, it was like a lesson in what you can do as, as a writer. Oh yeah, definitely. So beautiful. We've got a number of questions from our Patreon. So Excellent. the first is from Jake Marley. He says, when I took Gemma's Lit Reactor class, she really encouraged me to think outside the usual boxes of horror fiction. I was hoping she might talk a little about how playing with different story structures and perspectives affects her own fiction, especially in her short stories. Okay, um... Again, one of the wonderful things about short fiction is that because you know you don't have to live with this person for very long, you can imagine yourself into a person who is very antithetical to you and the way you, the way you are and the way you want to be. So if you want, if you want to go there, if you want to create someone who is just <laughs> really alien uh, to you um, and... In terms of my own, uh, my own druthers, uh, that could be a person who is, you know, uh, uh, a sixty-year-old Baptist housewife as easily as it could be a person who is, you know, uh, like a horrifying rapist, you know, waiting to do something awful to somebody else. Um, but because you don't have to spend a lot of time with them you can do that far more easily in a short story. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the wonderful things about short fiction. Um, and the other thing is that because you don't have to maintain it, um, you can do a structure that is very, very difficult to maintain. Um, so, like I said, you can experiment with the idea that um, your main character is totally misinterpreting everything that they're seeing. Um, you can, you can experiment with, um, you, you can experiment with, um, how you're going to tell a story. Uh, you can experiment with tense. You can experiment with, um, uh, with person. 
Um, there's, uh, there's something that I find that I often do when I'm having real trouble with a story, which is that I put it into, um, second person present. You are, you are this, you do this, this happens to you. Um, it is not a structure that you want to read an entire novel in, but for 4,000 words, you're fine. You're laughing. Um, and some of the, some of the best things that I've ever written, uh, in terms of short fiction, um, have come out of that. It's just me going, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to put it in the most ridiculous tense that I can think of and see what happens. Um, another person who has done that really well, um, God, Scott Edelman, uh, did an entire zombie story at one point in the future tense, which, you know, <laughs> You will do this. You will do that. This is what comes after. This is what will happen. Um, and again, this is not something you want to read an entire novel in. Not something you want to, you know, immerse your brain in. But um, yeah, for five thousand words, it's uh, it goes goes like a like s through a goose, and it's lovely. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that's one of the wonderful things about short fiction. Um, yeah, just 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 set your mind free, um, and a lot of short fiction also kind of begins like a campfire story. Um, I'm almost at the end of an anthology fill right now. Uh, I have to move on to something else, and I was trying to brainstorm the other day, and it was and it, I was literally sitting there writing writing ideas down in a notebook and. And they and they all go like so. There's this guy who's who. So maybe this happens, you know. Um, and sometimes you can just take. So there's this guy. So maybe this happens, and you can run with it. Um, there's a story that I'm very proud of called um, called That Place, which literally begins. So there are these two girls, twins, so and so and so and so, and they have to go back to their hometown because their parents have died in a car crash. And then the story just goes from there and keeps going. Um, and it's like someone telling it to you on the corner. <laughs> it's like, have you heard about this? <laughs> have, have you heard about the, the, you know, the house that follows you around? Have you heard about the, the thing that does this? Um, I, you know, uh, it's because it's a, it's a one shot and it's a small window of opportunity Anything to get you through that window is perfectly fine. It's perfectly allowable. Mm. Just mentioning that makes me think of, so, you know, when you start, like, listing things out, like, so there's this. You used to be a big fan of Andrew Dice Clay. Mm. And if you if you ever listen to his old show, if you can sit through it, because <laughs> yeah. I can't even sit no, through it's, it. Because it's, it's just like, oh, my God, this guy is so ruthless. But he he got to the point to where he would tell, you know, the same joke over and over and over, just different punchlines. Yep. And I remember one show that he, he that he said that. So there's this blah, 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 blah. I'm just getting to the punchline. Give me a minute. I'll get there in a second. Blah, 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 blah. And, you yep. know, Ta -da. And, it, and when you said that, I was like, but it's, it's amazing that you can use just that little B phrase. Yeah. And it, and and just in in springboard into something else. Yes, and and it's it's a little bitty thing. So there's this blank. Yes, and you just and you just keep going. Yeah, you just keep going with it. And it's something that John Langan said. It's like sometimes the, the craziest ideas in the world you start to really start to latch onto and go, oh, okay, wait a second. Uh, I think I might actually have a story here. Yeah, you know. <laughs> It was it was it was impossible at first, but I think I've got something, you know. And those are the things that make like excellent fiction because it's personal, you know. Yeah, yeah. And also, the great part is that you can revisit it. Um, I am a fan of what Doug Clegg calls the puke draft, where you just ram your way through that draft, and it's like everything comes out on the page, like. Bleh! And, um, you know, it's, it's when you're done, it's terrible. It's, you know, it's like the bones are there, right? 
the skeleton is there, yeah. but the skeleton may be there and it may not even be in the right order. You might actually have to, you know, clean off all the puke and then move the bones around to where they're supposed to be and then start rebuilding it up from the bones itself, you know, and laying in the ligaments and laying in, you know, putting in the organs and then sticking skin over the whole thing and, you know, and then it's done and you know, bake it <laughs> bake it and send mm -hmm. it off right. you know <laughs> spell check it sounds like something stephen king said you give yourself permission to you know to write shit yes <laughs> you know totally give yourself and, and, permission and to write because, shit. because yeah sometimes because if you don't i mean you won't get yeah, there sometimes you have to give yourself permission to write i literally have no idea what happens in this paragraph but there's a section here and then right. skip to the next section. Right. <laughs> yeah. Somehow we get to pop, you know, and mm. now we're in the next section. When you come back, maybe there is no 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 actual utility to have that section at all, and you can just cut it. That's the best thing. But um, but maybe when you come back, uh, by the time you come back, you the back of your brain will have been working on it for a while. What, what I often find, and I'm sure you find this too, um, or anybody who writes, uh, is that when you step away from the computer and you go do something else, suddenly your brain starts talking to you, you know, and you're like, oh, okay, that, that's how that has to happen. Okay, fine. Mm. You know, and you take out your phone and you, you know, send yourself an email yeah. <laughs> that says, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, um, the other day that happened to me and I was in, I was in, the, <laughs> I was in the pool. <laughs> I was in the pool with my husband and my son <laughs> at the gym. I had nothing to write down anything on and I had to just keep saying, saying the sentences to myself over and over mm. and over again until I could get out of the pool and go put my clothes on and then get my notebook out and write it down. But yes, this is, this is what you have to do. You have to give yourself permission to be bad, you know, mm. do the puke draft and then fix it afterwards because some people write beautifully the first time out, but most people don't. And that's perfectly fine. Mm. And with the puke draft, is this pre-planning? I mean, is the puke draft, in essence, that is the plan? And if so, is that something you also do for your longer projects? Because I know earlier in the conversation when you were talking about experimental film, you said mm. you'd write 30,000 words, then you'd kind of abandon it or have some sort of panic and then later yeah. you'd write another 30,000 words so yeah I guess I'm wondering how much of your stories are planned and how much are organic and if this is something that varies from story to story because it, it was quite surprising what you said about experimental film because it reads as if it's meticulously crafted which is obviously great whether you did or didn't. Um, I, I think because I lived with it so long, that's why it reads that way. Mm. Um, but like I said, I was I was working on the backstory. I was working on the narrative of the film itself and how the film was made and why the film was made and what the film was made about uh, throughout that entire process. And it was always the 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 you know the the main problem was always what is in the foreground how can I get, how can I stick this exposition together in a way that is not going to sound like me just sort of going in somebody's, you know, in somebody's ear uh, for, you know, 300 pages, because <laughs> that kind of sucks. Um, no, you have to, um, the, the point of writing a mystery to some degree is to figure out in what order do you learn this information and how do you learn this information and what does this information mean to you as you learn it. Those are the really important things and those were the things that I was having trouble with. Now, um, I would say that with novels in general, uh, I tend to be a planner. Um, I'm not a pantser. Uh, I'm not George R. R. Martin. Uh, I'm not. I'm not growing a garden. You know. I'm not even Stephen King. You know. Only being able to see. You know. Driving in the dark and only being able to see as far as my headlights will go. 
Um, I need to have some idea of where I start off and where I'm going to end up um, before I can start writing anything almost. Um, and I tend to outline in much the same way that I used to outline that I used to outline screenplays. Um, so I, I favor a three act structure. <laughs> Um, each of those three acts tends to have three acts. Uh, it tends to have, you know, beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and uh, that is, you know, that's the, the blueprint that I keep to. Um, sometimes you get into areas where you know that you can say, this has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen. But it's not until you're right inside of it that a kind of chemistry begins and an almost alchemical change happens. Um, and you will get caught up in the narrative itself and it will begin to change underneath you. And suddenly you'll realize, oh, I don't need this at all, but I need something else. Um, where do I have to go to get that thing? Uh, and, and it will become, uh, emotionally clear to you, uh, the further you go. Um, the novel that I'm working on right now, Nightcrawling, um, uh, contains a lot of memory work. Uh, stupidly, I decided that, oh, okay, so I'll, 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 you know, experimental film really worked. So I'll go back and I'll rifle my, <laughs> I'll, I'll do what I always said I never would do. And I'll go back and I'll rifle my, my life stuff and um, it, was an, it was an interesting thing that happened um, Cheesy and, uh, was doing a fundraiser and Sandra asked me to find a piece of juvenilia and come in and read it and so I, I brought a, a story in that I wrote when I was like I don't know, nine years old or something called um, Gore in the Woods <laughs> uh, and, it was, and it was pretty terrible um, but to find it, I had to go through a file of all my old stuff, old, old stuff. So stuff that I'd written when I was in like high school, stuff that I'd written um, even when I was in early university. And I kept finding, um, I, I, again, about 20 pages of a novel that I had tried to write three separate times. And each time I had been defeated by it because... Not because I didn't know exactly what I was trying to write about, but because I was too close to it. Because it was based on a, a, a part of my life um, in elementary school. Uh, the time uh, when I was like between, I'd say, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 at the absolute most. Yeah, elementary school was terrible. Elementary school was like the worst part of my life. Um, everything that could go wrong went wrong. <laughs> um, and it was so bad that for a while afterwards, uh, as I got into um, pre-high school and then into high school, I would remember things from this section of my life and it would be so immediate. It would be like getting emotionally punched and I would just be caught up in it and it would be impossible to move forward at all. So I made myself forget it. I, it, it, was, it was almost like I went into my brain and, and grabbed, uh, I, I don't know, a bunch of wires and ripped them out. And, you know, uh, so the good part was that I couldn't feel any of that stuff anymore. And the bad part was that it was like I completely forgot it. Um, and people would come up to me on the street uh, when I was in high school and go like, oh, Gemma, remember we were at Deer Park together? And I'd be like, what? <laughs> you know, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> it's like, literally, I had no idea who they were. Uh, not what their name was, not what their face looked like, nothing. Um, so in order to write about that, I have to do memory work and I have to go back into that. And it's, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting thing because for me to get deep enough to feel it, uh, it's almost like I can't see it. And for me to see it, I can't feel it. Um, so it's like, uh, it's like two different types of input. And it's like watching your life through a very dirty porthole and going, oh, that's why that happened. Hmm, interesting. You know, let's, let's, make, let's make notes of that. Um, so yeah, the, uh, yeah the, that 
is this weird kind of chemical thing which is driving this narrative along. And um, so I've got the whole framework for it. I know what has to happen. I know why it happens. I know what, who the characters are. Um, but I have to keep stopping and going, okay, here is an empty place where something is, and now I have to go into it and find out what that something is, what, what that something was, and then rifle through those memories for stuff I can actually use. Mm. And when you say you have to do memory work, what are the specifics? Yeah. I mean, is someone helping you unearth these repressed memories, or is this something you're doing on your own? I'd just like to know what that looks like. Okay, I'm pretty much doing it on my own, but every once in a while I'll ask my mother about something. Um, because, you know, she has her own memories at this time period. Um, the great part about fiction is that you don't have to be fair to people, right? Um, if I tell the story of what things were like for me during this time period, and someone says, well, I was there too, and I don't remember it exactly the same way, I can just say, well, too bad, because, you know, I'm the one who's writing the book. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. And also, I would be likely to remember it my way anyways, right? You know, I mean, looking back at it now at the age of almost 50 years old, things become very clear to me that were not clear to me when I was 10 years old, when I was 10 and a half. You know, um, I look at the people who bullied me. And for example, with one of them, I can see very clearly that she was not just a, me, a, a, a beautiful mean girl, she was also um, a, a girl with uh, a partially Arab background in a very, very white Toronto at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s. And I think she had her own something something that she was dealing with that I did not know anything about. Um, I think that there were reasons that she was, you know, lashing out at me, which were very different from the reasons that I was lashing out at everybody else. Um, but the great part is that I, I can internalize that and then I can make the decision, do I want to be fair or do I want to just go to the way that I felt it was at the time? Uh, and both things are useful. And also um, the interesting thing of this process is that writing about that process then becomes part of the book as well because uh, the book is um, as usual structured in three sections um, one section takes place during the present um, and one section takes place during the first year of university uh, in like 1992 probably um, and the third section is the section that takes place um, in 1979 to 1981. Um, and that section is being told through a notebook where the woman who is telling this, that part of the story is doing her own memory work. So she's seeing it the same way that I'm seeing my memories. So that's kind of fun. It becomes a part of the outline. It becomes a part of the delivery system. So this thing that otherwise would be really, really difficult for me um, becomes uh, becomes a part of my creative impulse. That's very cool. I'm hoping. I hope it's cool. You know, I have a deadline, so <laughs> <laughs> I got to actually, you know, speed it up pretty soon. <laughs> Yeah, well, when is the deadline for Nightcrawling, and when oh. when do you think we might get to see it? Nightcrawling is supposed to be delivered by the uh, by the end of March, mm. this this coming March, which means that hopefully you'll see it by October of uh, uh, twenty eighteen. Yeah. Fantastic and. Hey, definitely, if you can coincide it with Halloween, I mean, why not, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that is, in fact, the, the idea. Well, I was going to say, idea. that's probably not a coincidence. <laughs> oh, wow, what are the chances? Uh, a horror novel at Halloween. <laughs> there might yeah, exactly. be a plan. <laughs> might, might possibly be a plan. Mm.
Thank you so much for joining us for part two of our conversation with Gemma Files. Next episode we'll be back with the third and final part of the interview, though of course if you'd like to hear it ahead of the crowd then please do consider supporting us on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Every episode of the This Is Horror podcast goes up at least 24 hours in advance on Patreon. And we've got conversations coming up with Joe R. Lansdale, Livia Llewellyn and Nicole Cushing. Also, if we reach 110 patrons by the end of the month, we will be putting out double the This Is Horror podcast in September. So that means every single week you'll be getting two podcasts. So if that's something that you're interested in and you think we're worth a dollar, do consider pledging www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Before I wrap up, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. First up is Audible, and I love Audible. I use Audible every day. I listen to a number of books by authors we're interviewing on the This Is Horror podcast on Audible as part of my preparation. Most recently, I listened to The Magic Wagon by Joe R. Lansdale, and it's narrated by Chet Williamson. It's absolutely fantastic. Having a look at my Audible now, I've got The Illustrated Man by Ray Bradbury. I've got Lawrence Block's Liar's Companion, which is a non-fiction book on writing. I've got Pines by Blake Crouch. Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. So, a lot to choose from. And you can get a free trial. All you need to do is go over to www.audibletrial.com forward slash this is horror. You get to choose a free audio book and a free trial for 30 days. If you don't want to subscribe to Audible, you still get the audio book. So, win win. And now for our second sponsor, Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news. Now you can have a Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www patreon.com slash pmm publishing have a scary day all right to finish off a quote and this week we're going all the way back to plato here is a quote from plato books give a soul to the universe wings to the mind flight to the imagination and life to everything. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, look after yourself, be good to one another, read horror, and have a great, great day.